Forum for Community Foundations and the West Africa Civil Society Institute. We kindly plead with you that we will be recording this discussion. Many subscribed to join us, but unfortunately, their schedules might not permit. And of course, they are looking forward to what we will be discussing here. As you are joining us, please feel free to select your language of preference. The conversation will be interpreted or made available to us in the English language, in the French language, in Portuguese and in Spanish. To follow in your language of preference, kindly select the interpretation icon at the bottom of the Zoom platform. Once you click on the interpretation icon, you will see the language options. Kindly select that which you prefer to join this conversation with. Also, we kindly invite everyone joining to kindly put your microphones on mute. Kindly put our microphones on mute, please, and make use of the chat room as much as possible. It's going to be very interactive. The exchanges will be very, very fluid, and we count on your contributions to come predominantly from the chat room. Once again, for those who are just joining, please, we will be recording this session, so we kindly seek your consent to do so. And if you're joining and you want to follow in either the French, English, Portuguese, or Spanish language, kindly click on the interpretation icon and select your language of preference. At this juncture, we would like to know who is joining us and from where. So feel free to just in the chat, tell us your name, your organization, and where you are joining from. It will be a great pleasure to know the global spread of those participating in this important discussion. Of course, the conversation will focus on shift the power. The road to Bogota, what does shift the power mean to you? We have some wonderful discussants who will be sharing their insights and experiences on this, but it will be important to hear from you and we have ways and means that we will do this. One of them is through the chat room, and we kindly count on you to make use of the chat room as much as possible. And please feel free To introduce yourself, Abdul Noah, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Sierra Leone. We hope it is going well there. Meredith Roth, all the way from the United States of America, from Haifa International. We are indeed pleased to have you here with us. And Alex Tienan, Christian Aid, Ireland. Thank you for joining us all the way from Ireland. And of course, Nomsa Daniels, another colleague from Haifa International, joining us from Johannesburg, South Africa. Dylan, it is always a delight having you in these conversations, in these spaces. And you are joining from Peace Direct all the way from London. We are very, very much happy to be with you. Deborah Willick, all the way from Interaction in the United States of America. Thank you very, very much for joining. And of course, if I cannot read all the names and uh, the organizations we all represent, your presence is highly appreciated. And of course, your views as well. And please, as we unfold the discussion points, feel free to share your thoughts. In the chat room, we have many meta platforms that we will be using from time to time. Make use of them as well to share your views with everyone here. Aisha Farah, all the way from Comic Relief in the United Kingdom. Thanks for joining. Je ne sais pas, I am very curious to read from some of our colleagues in French-speaking countries. 
um, sorry for the bias. We just want our brothers from these spaces to be part of the conversation. And Larissa, all the way from Burkina Faso, we are very much happy to have you here with us. Joseph Adona, 38 Ghana, Medasipa. Thank you for joining us in this conversation. Again, it's being recorded. And if you want to follow this conversation in a particular language of preference, we have the English language, we have French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Kindly make use of the interpretation icon. Click on it and select your language of preference, and you will follow seamlessly. Thanks to everyone for joining. And at this juncture, it is it may be no news to some of us that the Shift the Power Summit is coming up from the 5th to the 7th of December this year in Bogota, Colombia, in South America. I am looking forward to that summit. I am sure many of us are looking forward to that summit. As a build up to that summit, it is important for the important topic on Shift the Power to make waves within the sector for us to think critically about what it means to us and of course, share insights, share inputs on what can possibly inform this summit that promises to be very pregnant. That is why we have this conversation today. It is one of many conversations that are being steered by the Global Fund for Community Foundations. And thank you very much, colleagues from the Global Fund for you know, championing this initiative. And we are all happy as members, you know, stakeholders of the Ringo community to be joining in this conversation today. We have some wonderful panelists who will be sharing their insights on this topic. But before we get there, it will be important to unravel what this Shift the Power stands for. As we look forward to the summit, it was birthed, the Shift the Power movement agenda was birthed by the Global Fund for Community Foundations. And we would like to invite Eshban. Are you there, Eshban? To just share with us some key insights on what is in this Shift the Power theme for Ra Inisha Tinks. Eshban, are you there with us, please? We will be coming to the speakers that we'll be talking to in a jiffy. Eshban, can you hear me, please? Hello, Eshban. I'm sure Eshban will be... Um, getting ready to join us in a short while. Jenny, Jenny Hodgson from the Global Fund for Community Foundations. Are you there, please? Andrea, est-ce que vous m'entendez, s'il vous plaît? Oui, oui, je vous entends bien. Once again, thank you all for joining. We are diving straight away into the conversations of this afternoon. And of course, for those who don't know, I am Jim Chick from Unjong. I work for the West Africa Civil Society Institute, which is based in Accra, Ghana. It is always a delight to share and learn from you all in these wonderful spaces. Jenny Hodgson, can you hear me, please? Jim, um, it's Dylan here. Just, I'm looking at the, the um chat it looks like both eshban and um jenny can't unmute themselves which i think must be a setting in the the zoom um setting so you might need to change the setting to enable them to talk great thank you very very much dylan we appreciate that um we will be changing the settings for eshban kesiga and jenny hodgson please I can unmute, so I hope Eshban can. Eshban, go for it. Great, thank you. Eshban, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm here now. Great. And sorry for, <laughs> for muting your mind, you know, whereas we really want to hear from you. It is always a delight, Eshban, having these conversations with you. And I'm sure many who are joining us 
may be hearing about shift the power for the first time. Others might have heard about it, but it's no harm rekindling our understanding of this wonderful phenomenon that is driving the ecosystem in this current era. Can you just give us a brief insight on what this shift the power is all about? Eshban? All right, I'm happy to be here. Uh, so the thing, the thing with shift, or the beauty with shift of power is that it means various things to various people. And I think that there's some beauty in that varied expression. But the hashtag was first used in 2016 at the Global Summit for Community Foundations in South Africa. And since then, it's it's kind of just taken on a life of its own. I think in the work of movements such as Me Too, Black Lives Matter, there are many people in the sector that felt that uh, that our own sector was long overdue for its own truth-telling moment. And to say that there's a lot about the way development happens today that's very much defined by power and that power is defined by who has resources or who has money and that those with power have tended to be dismissive of the experiences uh, of the global south and they've acted as though the global north is the world. Uh, they've been dismissive of the experiences, knowledge and resources as well uh, of the global south. And this has really been this truth telling moment that's been happening over the last couple of uh, of years, ever since the hashtag first emerged. So what it is really now is mostly uh, an articulation of the aspirations and many times the frustrations of those that work in, in, in international development. In around 2019, um, a group of organizations and people met uh, in London to, to start to articulate a, or to paint a, a vision of what a good society would look like, responding to questions on what do we need, what, do we, what, would, what would an ideal reimagined um, version of our sector look like. And out of that, they produced something that we now call the Manifesto for Change. Uh, and the Manifesto for Change is really a series of nine points. I say series to mean that it's not, um, I just post a link here. Yeah, so it's really nine points that start to paint a vision of what a good society would look like. And the, it's not a checklist, they're not standards, but rather nine conversation starters to offer inspiration uh, for those that might, for, for those that, for those that have over time been saying that the international aid industry had worked for many had had worked for some people but had not worked uh, for many people and that's really a brief history of shift of power as a movement and where it has come from and today the thing that we see and recognize is that no one person and no single organization uh, can do this work alone and that everybody in this movement is really like um, sometimes we use the analogy of a tree that everyone in this movement is like a branch or a leaf or a fruit and uh, collectively uh, they make the movement and it's never one organization or, uh, or one person. And that's really like a brief history of uh, Shift the Power and where it's come from. Over. Thank you so very much, Eshban, for really setting this context. And of course, some of the panelists will be diving deep into what you know, uh, what, what, what's in the Shift the Power Manifesto. And thank you, Eshban, for sharing, you know, the link with the key points with us. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we are indeed happy to have this uh, conversation with you. And we just want to get a sense of where we are at, you know, when it comes to Shift the Power. And so a Mentimeter link will be shared in the chat for our use. Um, once we click on the Mentimeter link, there are a couple of questions that we just want to tease our thoughts on what all of these are. Can we please have the Mentimeter link in the chat, please? A few questions just to get us thinking even before we dive into the conversation. And maybe you can start thinking about these from the top of your minds before the Menti metering uh, comes to us. You know, what is that one word, you know, that captures your understanding of shift the power? You know, in one word, you know, what does shift the power mean to you? We will be getting the Menti meter link in a short while in the chat, which everyone I'm sure will have access to 
and can share our responses, you know, to the questions that are on the link. Andrea, can we have the Mentimeter link in the chat, please? Great. So we have the Mentimeter link in the chat. Oh, thank you, Justin. Justin, you're very smart. You've already started typing in the, in the chat room. <laughs> I like that. Kindly make use of the, the link that has been shared and uh, share your responses. And I'm sure as we share our responses, that will be projected for us to see the diverse thoughts. And I think that will resonate with what Eshban said, that shift the power means different things to different people. Marion Lowe says, consciousness of self-worth leads to shift the power. Marion, it's always good to have you exchanging with us. We are looking forward to the thoughts that are coming in via the Mentimeter link. Ideally, Alba, we prefer a word, but you know, the thinking, the understanding of shift the power means different things to different people. So your diverse perspectives are most welcome. Yes, there you go. We are looking forward to the responses that will be coming in. One word that captures your understanding of shift the power. And I'm sure we can make use of the, the link that has been shared in the chat to share our thoughts. Great. We can see the words coming in. Decolonizing, change, relinquish, I like that. Assert, trust. Est-ce qu'il y a le mot qui vient en français, en langue française? Ça serait très, très bien de les lire. Ou en portugais, ou en langue portugais, ou pouvoir, I like that. I like that. Tega Wende says pouvoir, that's power, equity, improvement, Samuel, I like that. Amazing. So these are the words that are coming in and we can move to the next question. And this really reflect, I'm sure Eshban, we will agree with Eshban that, you know, it reflect the diversity of our understanding of what shift the power means. Um, there is supposed to be a second question, Andrea. One pain point in the current state of shift the power. That should be the second question that will be in our screens shortly. Oh, I like that. Hijack, injustice, exploitation. Institutional resistance. I think that is one word that sounds so loud in my ears. Self-determination, intention. Resource management locally, donors, common understanding. Great. Thank you to the over 120 respondents sharing their perspectives on this pain point. And I'm sure diverse stakeholders here present, these are the views of your partners, of your collaborators. What do these mean to us? As we move from this conversation, it will be important to imbibe these perspectives that are coming from sector players and see how well we can infuse them in our work and contribute to the change we want. And the third question, the third and last question, that is a very, very important question for us all. Are you planning to attend the summit? The Shift the Power Summit is right around the corner, days away from us. And of course, many are planning to, but it seems many more are not planning to. Of course, I am sure at some point in time, we will get some more information on how we can be part of this conversation. There is a website, you know, that is already warming up our minds towards what we should look out for and all the preparations towards the summit. A link to that website will be shared in the chat so that we can make use of the information therein. 
And I'm sure if you are working, you are a donor, you are an international non-governmental organization representative here present. If you are an actor working in Colombia, in South Asia, in uh, South Africa, or any part of Africa, make sure you book the dates of the 5th to the 7th so that you can join us in Bogota. Thank you very much, colleagues, for sharing your thoughts with us on these few questions. We will be diving. I can see Shuaibu Ibrahim has a point. Shuaibu, can you please share that in the chat and we will react to it, please. Kindly share your points in or the point you want to make in the chat and we will take it into account. Thank you very much, Ibrahim, for your kind understanding. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, we will be diving into the discussions for this afternoon. And we have some wonderful speakers who will be sharing their insights with us today. And of course, we will be taking, getting to know these speakers of this afternoon. And we'll begin with none other than Kate Moga. And Kate, um, currently, he, she holds the role of Global Director of Pledge for Change since July 2023. I'm sure a few of us might not know Kate, but you know her image will be projected on the screen in a very short while. Prior to joining uh, Pledge for Change, Kate worked with International Rescue Committee since 2013, where she was most recently the regional vice president for the Great Lakes and Central Africa. Kate was very close to my country of origin, that's Cameroon. Um, you, know, you know, she worked supporting organizations in Burundi, in Cameroon, in Chad, and the Central African Republic, not leaving out the Democratic Republic of Congo, and also Tanzania. Between 2003 and 2013, Kate held a variety of leadership roles with Save the Children, um, in South Sudan, in Democratic Republic of Congo, and Cote d'Ivoire, having begun her humanitarian work in protection services with refugees and asylum-seeking children in the United Kingdom. It will really be a delight to get Kate's perspectives, particularly because she is working with key stakeholders who have committed to ensure that their institutions will work towards the change we want. Kate. Good afternoon and happy to have you here with us. Hello, Kate. Thank you so much, Jim. Great. Thank you very, very much for joining this conversation. Um, next is none other than uh, Tegawende Astrid Larissa, all the way from Burkina Faso. She serves as a project manager at Pane. Pananet Tugri Initiative for Women's Welfare, a leading feminist organization in Burkina Faso that aims to promote the rights, development, and full potential of young women and girls in Francophone West Africa. As an eco-feminist, a local development specialist, and community-based projects manager, Tegawende is committed to sustainable and inclusive development, starting with grassroots organizations. It's important to note that Tegawende, you know, is currently a Shift the Power Fellow, this community that is being put together by the Global Fund for Community Foundations. And she, in this role, she aims to reflect on the factors of community involvement that lead to greater mobilization of local resources, particularly in conflict-prone environments. Tegawende, c'est fut un plaisir d'être avec vous. Bon après-midi. Merci. Content d'être là aussi. Great. And the next is one leader of a very renowned organization that I admire so much. Grace Maingi is the executive director of the Kenya Community Development Foundation, which is based in Kenya. You know, KCDF began its work in Kenya in 1997 as a public foundation that nationally supports communities to address their priority needs and challenges sustainably. Grace is a human rights lawyer who has been working over the last 20 years 
in the not-for-profit sector in Kenya. Her work has focused on civic education and engagement, constitutionalism, promoting free and fair elections, women's rights and growth within the legal profession in Kenya. Her passion for social justice and community development aligns with her main drive to reduce inequality. I'm sure you now understand why we can't wait to hear the views of Grace. Hello, Grace, and good afternoon. Hello, Jim. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have you know, an opportunity to exchange with you, Grace. The last but no, not the least is Barbara Nost. Barbara is the Chief Executive Officer of the Zambian Governance Foundation for Civil Society. Before coming to Zambia, Barbara worked in various long and short-term assignments broadly related to governance, institution building, and civil society development in Europe, and Africa. Having worked in the formal aid sector in various capacities as a desk officer, as a consultant, as a program coordinator, and as the CEO of a local organization in Zambia, she experienced the power imbalances that come into play when actors in the global north and the global south collaborate. She believes that local communities have the power and resourcefulness to shape their development without relying on external aid. And I'm sure we will all be very, very curious to learn more from Barbara on what the Zambia Governance Foundation has been doing around this. Hello, Barbara, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Great. It is indeed a pleasure to be with every one of you to be with everyone here this afternoon. And I would just want to invite you, Grace, you know, to really open up this conversation for us. I am sure you follow keenly the diverse perspectives of different participants here on what shift the power means to us. But from your standpoint, particularly coming from the Kenya Community Development Foundation, what does shift the power mean to you? And how has it been informing the great work that your organization has been championing over the years? Grace? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And I think all the input that came in in terms of what shift the power means to different people is a great starting point. Um, as Ashman has said, there have been a lot of conversations in terms of the challenges that we have with the international development system. And a recognition that we need to change things. Um, as much as the work has gone on, something is broken and we need to change that if we want to see a better society, if we want to see real change in the different spaces in which we work in. So for us as KCDF, core to that is putting communities at the center of everything that we do. Uh, being a community foundation, we are privileged that we're able to do this in Kenya we're able to work closely with different organizations. Um, those at the national level, those right at the, at the community level to really see how can we ensure that everything that we are doing is really centering communities. And can we um, be careful in terms of what we think should happen, but listen more to communities, what are they already doing? And how can we see our role as coming alongside communities as opposed to being the drivers of the change. For we're, so we're privileged as, as KCDF to be joining communities in their journey and seeing what are the key things we can bring to address issues around injustice in a sustainable manner. And so for us, shifting power requires us to check our biases we really check out, have to check our biases in terms of how we think capacity should be undertaken, checking our biases in terms of what we think would work at the community level and really listening to communities and then seeing what we're able to bring alongside what communities are doing. Let me stop there for now, Jim. That, that is really, really amazing. Thank you very much. And um, I'm keen on hearing from, you know, um, an organization that is very close to yours down in, in Zambia. Barbara, coming to you and the great work that the Zambia Governance Foundation, you know, has been championing over the years. 
how has you know the shift the power manifesto and its content or some of its content inspire inform shape some of the great actions that you've been leading on barbara and i'm sure barbara would want to make use of her slide um barbara can you hear me please Barbara Nost. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, can you can you see the slide, or do I do you want me to share it here? Okay, you can you can share the slide, please. Well, let me try if I manage um, share okay. slide. It is being shared. It is being shared. It's... Kindly just oh, wait. There oh. you go. Yes. Excellent. Okay, so you all see Thank it. You. Okay. So this is the slide I have draft. I mean, I've I've put together today because I think it very much uh, explains um, our journey, all the the issues we are struggling with, uh, what we should do, and how how we counter the current development system, and what we what we struggle with at, at various levels, from at funders level, at civil society level, at, at uh, amongst peers amongst at uh, community level and institutional level and individual level. So I think um, for us, um, we are an established NGO, we have resources, and I think we are, we are privileged like KCDF to use this privilege. And we should use this privilege to promote the shift the power manifesto and the entire ethos around it. And we should not fear the poverty of the stomach, fearing for our existence, fearing for our shelter, food employment, uh, put it bluntly. I think we, we need to fear, that we, there should be no fear of losing out with funders, uh, no fear for our existence um, that should hinder our attempts to promote an alternative system. Um, I think the shift the power um, um, hashtag has become a trademark um, and one can no longer ignore the movement and the new way of thinking about development. And I truly believe that uh, this conversation have advanced sufficiently uh, across the globe and amongst civil society, and probably also amongst donors, that we must not fear any reprisals. We ourselves should not be ready to give up something to gain. And on, uh, we should not be ready to give up something, but we should always ready to gain something new. So I think giving up opens new ways of thinking and of working. And maybe um, these are some of the, 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 the ways I would like to discuss in, at the various levels. We have various um, um, ways of, you know, uh, advancing shift the power. Um, I think we all, all know that um, many, traditional funders have no interest in shifting power or their attention to shifting power remains a mere rhetoric. But I think we must engage these funders actively and we need to know what, what we believe in and what the right, right approach is uh, uh, support in supporting civil society and communities. I, I, if you all remember 2020, uh, uh, 210 uh, uh, organizations, NGOs from all over the world have signed the open letter to INGOs who are looking to localize operations. I think this was a first big success, or uh, a big success uh, for, for, lo for, for Global South organizations uh, to tell INGOs, uh, to tell funding institutional funders that th this is not the way to go. But we can, we can also be actively get involved in initiatives like, like RINGO, Reimagining INGOs, that uh, of that, uh, all the, the sub-initiatives like debating the ramification of uh, risk management, traditional risk management, participatory grant making, decolonizing advisory services, untying aid to northern NGOs, or debating the, uses, the use of language and uh, uh, formulating a new alternative lexicon. And we should also not shy away from speaking about, uh, up against, this is my favorite topic, against how climate fin finance is not trickling down to local organizations. There was a, uh, there was an, an, an meeting yesterday, which was extremely interesting. Uh, we ourselves, and I would like to mention this, continue to submit applications, but we know 98% uh, or almost 100% will never get any response or we always be rejected. But despite not, uh, and despite us having gone an extra mile to prepare detailed, uh, detailed information uh, showing the rate of deforestation in local communities, providing GIS maps, uh, I think, however, uh, it, it helped us learn, and it, this is also, also a way of us learning uh, a language that we do not use, 
uh, and we get introduced to the right people in your organization. I think we need to use this language to devise and formulate a strategy to approach them, uh, these funders, new funders, as a collective and challenge these approaches because climate finance is not trickling down. So, and at civil society uh, level, um, we are trying to promote this approach of shifting power, of shifting powers. And uh, we are often, this is often considered as a noble approach, but it's also considered naive to some extent by our peers and other CSOs. They might want to uh, involve us in conversations, and uh, but they might not. They might uninvite us, with, as, which has also happened, because they see uh, this, this movement as an ex existential threat to the current donor-dependent civil society establishment. And I think we also need to openly talk about challenges of prevailing pre development practices. Um, and we hold, for example, meetings uh, in which we debate the same issues. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are inviting people for learning events. We need also to form alliances and get a better understanding who are our natural allies. For, in our case in Zambia, I think our natural ally is the agroecology movement or the small-scale small, small scale farmers that are attached to the agroecology movement, including those ones who work on food sovereignty um, or those ones who are supporting the Our Food is African campaign. So um, then at community level, uh, I think similar to KCDF, we also work with the community at the center. We emphasize in our approach the responsibility to decide on their development path lies with the community itself. And we, we are the facilitators of this process. We are promoting the use of local resources, their skills, their knowledge, their in-kind contributions. And um, we use the APCD approach, the asset-based community development approach. And uh, we facilitate communities understanding how they can use uh, their assets and appreciating their own worth and their own role in the development process. So we are. This entire process kind of helps ignite self-worth and self-esteem and pride amongst people. And that changes, flips the situations, flips the, the, the relationship with our community completely. It becomes a, a, a relationship of friendship, a relationship where we become a party, an interested party, rather than being an uninterested or third party that only comes in and moves out for particular events. At NVIDIA level, I would say, um, we promote the vision of a good so society. For example, we talk about environment justice, community development based on solidarity, local leadership, gender equality, dis disability equality, uh, shared leadership uh, by using the ABCD approach. We also value is, um, like uh, values like um, dignity, agency, self determination. And we try to promote this concept in our interaction with communities. Um, but we also need to be honest with ourselves. Our practices uh, sometimes lag behind, and I think that's where I see challenges amongst civil society. We have an ideal of good society, but uh, these values are not always reflected in how we practice our work or, or in our behavior. A typical example, I would say, is the lack of consensus over gender equality or versus cultural norms or uh, or uh, any discussion about gender equality or um, uh, our discussion about how we should interact with marginalized communities, meaning with the LGBTI community. There isn't, no, there isn't a consensus and there's much work uh, yet to be done. There's so, so I think there's a tension amongst ourselves, including ourselves, because we are far from being perfect. We're trying to move and integrate, shift the power, the values into organization. There's a tension between stated values and practice. And I think this stems, stems from a deep-rooted beliefs of, of the individuals that work in the organizations. And this is, a, this is an, something many, many organizations struggle with. And I, I think this is a dilemma. And mm. I, to be honest, I have no answer to that. Um, Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. You wanted to learn, I think. Sorry? I think you wanted to say something. Sorry, I interrupted. Okay. Can I continue or do you want me to? Okay. Um, I think we also need to um, uh, discuss or take into account how internal decision-making processes are structured in the organizations we work. Do we allow staff to participate 
in, in major decision-making processes. Do we have the right DNA? Do, does the board understand what it means to become a more community-focused organization? Can the board uh, be ready to move from a hierarchical organization to an organization that is at the forefront of community, of building a community of practice or a movement? I think we also must dismantle, for example, traditional risk management, the issues around fiduciary responsibilities. We must, the board must debate about what powers they must let go if participatory grant making is, is to be the, the, the main thing to do. And we must, as organizations, simply dismantle hierarchies and become flat to organizations. And then the, the, last, the last important big challenge is um, we have to get uh, let go of old fashioned legislations that govern our organization in Zambia. We, the Companies Act for Non-Profit Companies, organizations, it, it stems from 1959, and Zambia became independent in 64. So are these pieces of legislation useful for and are ready for the challenges of our times? I doubt it. I think there's a lot to be done for global civil society. And lastly, I would like to also state, which is very important, we, and we tend to also, all, often forget to talk about it, we need to clean our house. We need to be not only accountable to the funders, we are insufficiently accountable to the communities we serve. Uh, and, we and this accountability needs to be embedded in the engagement with the community. So I think um, changing ourselves is the most important. And that's why you, the last one manifesto principle is uh, change ourselves. Um, and I think in times which is described as one of poly crisis and ecosystem collapse and war and hunger and increasing poverty, uh, inequality. We can no longer try to hold on to what is mine or to what is ours. We need to let go of silos and we need to start working together. And our internal workings, our organization structures must reflect the society we would like to see. And I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Barbara, for those insightful views that you've shared. And I think um, while you were doing that, Teresa uh, Jangara of the African Philanthropy Network uh, shared an, an article that complements some of your views. Um, the link is in the chat for those who might be interested in taking that up. And also just to say, uh, maybe we may not have the opportunity to exchange again with Barbara. So we, if we have any questions, we can share in the chat and hopefully she can respond before she takes up another en engagement. Meanwhile, I want to come to you, Tega Wende, um, from all the way from Burkina Faso, a Shift the Power Fellow committed to taking practical steps to see how you can mobilize grassroots organizations, you know, to comprehend and uphold, you know, what we are talking about when it comes to Shift the Power. From your perspective, uh, Tega Wende, what are some of the practical ways that some of our organizations can work to ensure that we are championing efforts that advance the Shift the Power agenda? Take a window. Est-ce que vous m'entendez, s'il vous plaît? Merci beaucoup, Jimmy. C'est un plaisir okay. aussi d'écouter euh, d'éminents panélistes, d'apprendre de, d'eux, de partager ces expériences-là. Et je dois dire que la réponse à cette question-là n'est qu'une facette, n'est qu'une des réponses. Euh, Quelques-uns des outils simplement pratiques que je pourrais partager. Euh, sinon, l'ensemble des organisations, d'une façon ou d'une autre, pourraient, voilà, auraient d'autres pratiques euh, à partager. Et c'est tout ça qui fait aussi la force de la philanthropie communautaire. Euh, donc, pour ma part, avant même de pouvoir répondre à cette question-là, pour être honnête, il n'est même pas possible <rire> de mettre en œuvre ces pratiques-là si on n'est pas ouvert à l'apprentissage continu, à l'adaptation de nos approches au niveau des organisations en fonction des besoins et des retours d'expérience des communautés. Ce n'est pas possible. C'est la première étape. Il faut être prêt, des fois même, à remettre en cause sa conception même du développement. Et c'est ça qui va permettre aussi de pouvoir les améliorer, de les adapter en fonction de la des communautés. Et donc, je vais juste partager quelques petits outils qui pourront être complétés euh, par mes pères ici présents. Euh, donc, on peut mettre en, pla en pratique ce qu'on appelle la capacitation authentique. Qu'est-ce que la capacitation authentique? Ce n'est rien de plus que de 
former les communautés, mais en tenant compte de l'expertise locale. Il faut oublier des fois, je pense, les clichés où l'organisation locale arrive en se disant qu'elle a les solutions à tous les problèmes. Il faut oublier ça. Les communautés ont souvent elles-mêmes les solutions aux problèmes qu'elles ont. Et ce qui leur manque simplement, c'est ce petit boost-là pour pouvoir les mettre en œuvre. Je vous donne le cas du changement climatique. Bon nombre de communautés, en Afrique notamment, ont déjà leur pratique d'adaptation. Donc, il est important déjà de respecter ce savoir local-là, dans la façon dont nous adressons notre propre savoir. Un deuxième aspect est, je pense aussi, de pouvoir retravailler l'aspect de la mobilisation des ressources. Euh, je dirais même plutôt de valoriser les ressources locales. Quoi il est bien vrai que euh, les financements internationaux ont leur importance, ça c'est sûr. Mais il faut trouver les voies et moyens, les mécanismes nécessaires pour valoriser les contributions en nature. Et ces contributions-là, ce sont généralement ce que la communauté peut offrir. Aller s'asseoir par exemple sous un arbre à palabre au village pour avoir un focus group, cet espace-là, c'est la contribution de la communauté. Donc, c'est trouver les voies et moyens pour valoriser ces contributions-là. Et pour moi, le maître mot qui coiffe tout ça, il faut être honnête, c'est la transparence et la redevabilité. Ça ne peut pas se faire sans ces deux aspects-là. Récemment, je ne sais pas si vous êtes au courant, euh, il y a eu une phase pilote de la mise en œuvre du cadre de redevabilité féministe dans huit pays pilotes, en Afrique, en Amérique du Sud, en Asie aussi. Et le Burkina Faso aussi faisait partie de ces pays pilotes-là. Et l'objectif de l'étude qui a été conduite par l'initiative Pendant Touri pour le bien-être de la femme, dans laquelle je travaillais en ce moment, euh, était véritablement de voir quel est l'état d'avancée des objectifs qui ont été pris lors du Forum Génération et Égalité en 2021. Et à l'issue de cette étude-là, je, je dois vous avouer qu'on était tous surpris parce que la même question revenait. Est passé l'argent? Où sont passés ces millions de dollars qui ont été promis ou injectés dans le but d'atteindre les objectifs du Forum Génération et Égalité? Et malheureusement, ce sont des questions qui, vont, qui reviennent fréquemment dans la plupart des projets qui sont mis en œuvre au niveau local. Il est important d'intégrer cet aspect, ce principe de la transparence et de la redevabilité envers les communautés pour que euh, cela puisse se faire. Et bien entendu, coalition forte. J'insiste là-dessus. Parce que même si nous, mettons en œuvre, nous, nous menons des plaidoyers pour favoriser le changement des différentes politiques au niveau national, sous-régional, international. Ce n'est pas possible si les coalitions ne sont pas fortes. Et donc, il est vraiment important de pouvoir nouer ces partenariats-là, tant au niveau local qu'au niveau international, qui vont véritablement permettre de pousser le mouvement. Donc, je vais m'arrêter là, Jean. Amazing. And we will definitely be coming back to you, uh, Tega Wende. Thank you very much for those insights. And Kate, I am coming to you right now. Working with Pledge for Change, you are in the meet, maybe at the epicenter of key actors whom we are demanding a lot from them when it comes to shift the power. From the interactions you've been having so far, the engagements, the commitments, the actions, what are you seeing? when it comes to their intent and pragmatism to ensure that there is, they veritably shift some power. Kate? Thanks so much, Jim, and hello, uh, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be sharing the, the Zoom room uh, with such an amazing panel today. Um, I'm really appreciative to see so many people um, listening in. Um, So before I try and answer your question, Jim, I'm just going to give a few seconds on what is Pledge for Change, um, because I think this is known well by some um, and, uh, and less well by others. Um, the Pledge for Change is a, it's a relatively new um, initiative. 
um, which intends to reimagine the role of international NGOs in the global humanitarian and development um, aid systems. Um, uh, this uh, effort was put together um, under a convening led by Dagan Ali from Adesso um, that started a couple of years ago um, and has now, now signed up 12 of the large um, international NGOs and about 20 supporters coming from um, civil society organizations, networks, um, and some funders. Um, the pledges that these uh, organizations have committed to uh, focus on how INGOs can transform their approaches under three pledges. So we've got equitable partnerships, authentic storytelling, and influencing the wider system. Um, and through those pledges, we aim to catalyze change to happen at the level of policy and practice, programs, communications, uh, and advocacy. And I think an important link and a, and a reason why I hope that Pledge for Change will be an important actor in the shift for power ecosystem um, is that all the signatories have signed up to principles of solidarity, humility, self-determination and equality. Um, and we also aim to practice distributed leadership. So there's a lot of alignment with the shift for power uh, manifesto, um, I would say. Uh, I, somebody's lost audio. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me? Yeah, we're still yeah, good. Yeah, we, we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay, fantastic. Um, and so what I think is implicit in uh, in Jim's question, um, IMGOs are, are good at signing up uh, to commitments. Um, and I know that there's a lot of appetite in this group um, and others to see the, the tangible uh, change that's happening as a consequence of these commitments. Um, so I wanted to go through some of the specific commitments that the INGOs have made, and then to ask for your support uh, as partners in the ecosystem in holding INGOs to account to the achievement of these. Um, you can find a more detailed version of this on the website that Alex has kindly put in the chat. Um, but the practical ways in which uh, Pledge for Change aims to shift power include making equitable partnerships the default approach by 2030 uh, for all the INGOs who've signed up to it. So that means national and local organizations leading humanitarian and development efforts wherever possible. In order to achieve that, allocating more resources um, to enable national and local organizations to take the lead. Increasing collaboration between INGOs to reduce duplication of effort um, and developing a common approach to compliance and due diligence, um, which could also link to more pooled firms and other steps to achieve economies of scale. Taking a more collaborative approach to risk management, um, so getting rid of the, the or avoiding applying stricter risk requirements to, to partners than to those INGOs and looking for ways to minimize the compliance burden um, on civil society organizations, sharing the burden of costs in ways that will make those partners stronger and more sustainable, reflecting the commitments um, in the pledge to anti-racism, to locally led initiatives, gender equality and equitable partnerships in the fundraising that we're doing and trying to use that to influence the donors um, within the ecosystem uh, as well. Avoiding exploitative imagery that portrays people as helpless victims and giving credit to partners and communities. Strengthening efforts to make the storytelling ethical and safe based on informed consent and accurate representation not using jargon that confuses our audiences and thinking about the coloniality of language access, um, uh, which is one of the things that I know Shift the Power is also very focused on as evidenced in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, using language and imagery to inspire wider cultural change through the co-production of stories, photographs and videos with local organizations and talent. And then tracking the progress to make sure that we, um, the implementation of this uh, of these pledges 
is reported publicly and transparently to show all of you, um, your partners uh, and the wider ecosystem, that this is more than another list uh, on paper um, and that the INGOs are really walking the talk. Um, and, and finally, on that point, sharing what we learn and demonstrating how we're shifting power and resources um, to the Global South with the aim of encouraging a wider group of INGOs, um, donors and others who hold power in the system to follow suit, including through this engagement. And I think that's part of the reason I'm so delighted to be on this panel, um, but also to be with you all on the road to Bogota to, to take your recommendations and feed those back into the INGOs um, so that we're able to collectively hold them to account as they move through their part of the transformation. Mm. Thank you very much, Kate. And there are some very interesting insights coming in the, in the chat and we'll be taking some questions from there in a short while. But Grace, I just want to, um, I'm sure we will be very curious to hear from you. you know, you play a very critical role, working directly with communities, connecting, you know, the wonderful communities you work with, with the diverse actors you equally work with. You know, how can civil society organizations within the current ecosystem live by the shift the power manifesto and ensure that indeed we work towards ensuring that there is a shift in power? Grace? Thanks, Jim. And um, I think one of the key things that we have to do um, to ensure that we are working towards a good society is to stop putting the focus on us. Stop putting the focus on us as um, different civil society actors. It shouldn't be about us, um, as Barbara mentioned in the beginning. It really should be about the communities that we are working with and that we are serving. And so being able to see the the beauty of our contribution to bring into life what communities are already doing as opposed to being fixated with our logos as as has been said in other forums you know putting aside our egos as has been said in other forums but really seeing our work as a contribution to those communities so if there's anything that we are doing that is not partnering with communities, that is not really bolstering any work that communities are doing to address challenges that they're facing, then that already shows us that we are on the wrong path. If it's about us, then we are on the wrong path. We're not shifting power. So we should be looking towards ensuring that we are listening more and speaking less. We are building and, and coming alongside communities to hear really what do they need and putting resources towards that. So what does that practically mean? It means it's not about KCDF's work plan or KCDF strategy. It's about those communities that we're serving. If those communities are saying we need X, Y, Z to be able to address our sustainability, what role is KCDF or other organizations playing to facilitate their sustainability. So I'd say the key thing, all our work should not be about us. We really need to concentrate on putting communities at the center. Thanks. Thank you very much, Grace. And I'm just smiling because, you know, it felt to me like some insights from your newsletter should be shared, you know, with us here because you championed a lot of that through your newsletter. And we invite everyone here to visit the website of KCDF you know, try to download some of their newsletters and see how the communities are at the center. That may inspire us. I can see Deborah Duan, you know, addressing Kate. Kate, there is a clarion call for you. Kate Moga, you know, it would be great to have more INGOs directly present in Bogota. Kate, we count on you to ensure to work with your collaborators and have many more INGOs present in Bogota. Um, uh, Isabel Jan equally says, if you want to reach out to the Pledge for Change Secretariat, there is an email in the chat, you know, for Ross. There is a question for you, um, 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 Kate, and please, colleagues, you can share your contributions in the chat or share questions, you know, that we can use to interact with the wonderful panelists we have. Jonathan Glennie says, with Pledge for Change, is there a coordinated advocacy strategy bringing together our common resources and political weight to pressure organizations to change. I am a mega fan of the Shift the Power movement, but 
dot, 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 I think we need to shift into coordinated advocacy strategy mode because power doesn't give up power without a fight. Kate, can you attempt to share some insights on that? I can. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I love I love the question, um, and I have a I have a, a a complex answer. So I'll I'll try and and see if this works. Um, the the short answer um, is yes. There will be a, um, a a coordinated advocacy strategy. As it happens, I was on a call just uh, an hour ago with the influencing group um, of the, the Pledge for Change, um, which brings together um, members of the signatory and supporter organizations precisely to, to, to shift into coordinated advocacy strategy mode. Um, because I agree, power doesn't give up power without a fight. The um, the, the nuance that I would add to that, and this is really listening to Grace, um, listening to um, to Tego Ande, hearing um, the, the, the important reminder that very often as we try and shift power, we replicate power dynamics and harmful practices that, that don't enable us to change the system in meaningful ways. So I'm very mindful of the risk of within Pledge for Change, international NGOs um, coming together with their significant resources um, that are available to them and working on an advocacy strategy that serves uh, their purposes. Um, and I'm very mindful of the importance of um, being really congruent with these values, really mindful of the ethics of how are we developing advocacy strategies and with whom, um, in order to make sure that they reflect the, the diversity of views and the, and the real change um, that we're trying to model and practice, both in process and in outcomes. Um, so that's, that's a, a piece of work that necessarily takes time, um, doesn't allow us to uh, work in ways which have become quite familiar to INGOs um, of kind of projectizing advocacy and identifying targets and, and going for it, but thinking intentionally all the way through about how are we using voice and power um, to bring the voice and power of a wider group of extraordinary advocates with a very different experience of what needs to change and very different views of how to get there that might be held at the level of the INGO um, centers, uh, which is which is uh, often where um, these things are currently staffed. So I hope I hope that makes some sense. Um, please take it as an invitation, uh, everyone to get involved, um, to join us in our influencing work, um, to, to, to make that as um, as congruent and, and aligned as, as possible. Thanks. That is a very amazing invitation, Kate, and I'm sure Many of us who are looking forward to the summit in December will find that space, find those critical actors to connect with and ensure that we continue with this conversation. You know, uh, Robert White, you know, says, and he's talking back to what Grace initially shared about the community, putting the communities at the center. Grace's point resonates very well with me in shifting the power. It should be about communities. We should partner them to make them realize their dreams. Let them occupy the space and we come in when they need us. Let's not displace them. Let's not displace them. The same call we are making at international organizations should be practiced at all levels. Thank you very much, Robert. And Deborah Duan says, it would be great to hear from some funders present here. Why isn't money yet reaching the, the local sufficiently? Why can, what can we do in Bogota to help this along? What do you need from the movement? It will be important, you know, to see um, what reactions, you know, some of the donors here present have to this. It is important for you to enlighten us on what's cooking, what's happening on the ground that we may not be aware of. Nubia Estela, um, she's shared something in, I guess this should be Spanish. Muchas gracias por estos espacios. I'm sure it's for this um, space. She's appreciating. 
Yes, go on, please. I'm sure Nubia is, is, is appreciating us for creating this space and uh, we will be in Bogota. I'm sure that's what Nubia is saying. Is saying. Gracias, Nubia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it will really be very important. We are talking um, the road to Bogota. We are looking forward to seeing many or all of us in Bogota come December 5, 2024. While we will continue these conversations, it will be important to hear from one of those key actors who's in our midst and who is championing efforts to ensure that the summit creates a space for us to achieve another actionable milestone when it comes to shift the power. Jenny Hodgson of the Global Fund for Community Foundations, are you there, please? I am, Jim. Great. I love that authoritative voice. And many of us <laughs> would like to hear from you, Jenny. What's cooking? What's on the ground? And what should we expect from this long-awaited summit? Jenny? Oh, Jim, you put so much pressure to make this feel like it's going to be amazing, right? <laughs> Thank you very much it's... for the invitation and for, and for organizing this conversation today. So, so let me say a little bit about the summit and why um, we, we felt um, after the 2016 summit, which was a sort of organic, accidental emergence of extraordinary energy, particularly from Global South actors, talking about power, not just in, in the context of Global North, Global South dynamics, but also, as, as Grace had mentioned, you know, the importance of not just perpetuating the same kind of power dynamics at a local level. In 2019, we did a meeting in London, which really continued to kind of grow. I think we talk about the growing the demand side of systems change, but a lot of discussion around shifting power, decolonizing aid is still happening in INGO and donor spaces. And actually, if you're a frontline organization working on the ground with few resources, exhausted, having come through COVID, where you suddenly had to become a health expert, when do you stop and think about the system that you're operating in and the system you want? So it felt like after, after at the end of COVID, um, maybe there was a time really to kind of reignite that spark of the system we want, the good societies that we're all working towards. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the day to day of our work, we forget about the normative values of why we're all doing this work, which is about improving the lives of other people, allowing people to live with equity, dignity, justice, to be able to live the kind of lives they want to lead. And that idea, I think, that clearly no single organization is going to deliver that itself. So could we create a space that would allow people to come together and say, what does it take to work towards the system we want, rather than how do we solve the problem of getting money from A to B, in which case we've often already you know, lost our sense of the purpose of what this work is all about. So in January, we did a call um, to the world to say who would like to host the summit and colleagues from Bogota stepped forward and said we'd like to host the summit and so since then we've really been trying to um, use the language of weaving and of emergence to shape what will what will happen there the invitation is really to everyone and anyone wherever they are in the philanthropy civil society international development ecosystem who believes that other ways of doing things are possible who are less preoccupied about their job, their job title, making their organization get bigger, competing for funds against others, but really thinking about what does transformation really look like? And to start that conversation from a different sort of place. So we, over the last um, three or four months, we've received about 150 ideas of things that people think matter towards the Shift the Power Summit and what needs to be discussed. And it's clear that there are some buckets that are starting to emerge. There's a big thread around reimagining the systems and structures of the system. So there's work which has been done by Temrise Khan. I don't know if she's on the call. I saw her earlier in Pakistan, work that Barry Knight and Rebecca Henshaw have, Henshaw have done around reimagining development aid, global public investment, which Jonathan Glennie is involved in and many others on this call too, and, and Waxi is part of the GPI network. There is a moment where these conversations are starting to happen at last around a complete re-envisaging. There is a big thread around decolonizing aid and decolonization, and that's been super exciting to see. So organizations in Uganda, in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Nigeria, starting to lead conversations 
that don't just um, look at the system we're in now, but really understand why is it we are swimming in these systems that were actually product of a colonial view of the world, of assumptions around where expertise came from. We have systems and structures that were built on a particular logic about where money came from, where expertise is and isn't, where capacity is and isn't. And so I think it's a really exciting moment, again, to see voices from the South starting to come up and saying, actually, we need to ask ourselves these questions so that we don't become part of the problem too. There's another bucket around um, sort of peace building, building inclusive societies that people want to talk about. What is community? Is, a com is community a place of harmony or is it a place of conflict and contestation? And how do we, in this very complex time, equip ourselves? Do we need job dif different job titles? Do we need different skills? Do we need to think about brokering, articulating, negotiating, rather than just designing linear projects and promising the world when the world clearly won't happen. So, that, so at the moment we're in this, um, if, you're, if you like control, then you will find this very messy. <laughs> I, I don't mind the messiness, but it is quite messy. But the idea really is to sort of work on the energies of the things people think that matter, that together can converge and actually help contribute to the vision of this system we want strongly in the belief that this has to be done through different configurations of actors, whether they're in the global south, south, global north, whether they're in donor organizations or grassroots actors, we need to create new kinds of alliances. So in Bogota, we really want to model that space as saying, we are all just people sitting in different parts of the system. Imagine what we could do together if we actually looked each other in the eye. So that, that's the, the, the experience that we're trying to create is to remove ourselves from philanthropy, international development, civil society as an industry, and really start to challenge ourselves to say, actually, if we were going to build a system we want, what, what needs to happen and how can we do this? So that's what we're preparing for. We have 420 people registered so far. I would love to see more, more representation from international NGOs. I think of that, there's probably about 20 people who I, of, of INGOs that I recognize that are, are the larger ones. And it does seem that if you're not at this party, I don't know what party you'd be at to have this conversation. There are people from 65 countries, strong representation from the global south. Like this seems like a very unique and different space for us to challenge ourselves to come up with something different. I'll leave it there, Jim. Mm, amazing. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm sure the invitation has been well taken by everyone here present, especially from our colleagues in the INGO space. I think a question came in the chat um, with regards to where have previous summits, you know, uh, taken place and... Uh, uh, sure. There's only been, yes, please, Jenny. Yeah, so the first one was in Johannesburg. Uh, it was started off meant to be for 100 people, 400 people came. And then we did a smaller meeting in London in 2019, really with a strategy to take the conversation to a global north context. So we've only done two of these before. Um, yeah, this is the third event. Thank you very much, Jenny. And I like the questions that are coming in in the chat. Clara. Higgins is asking where do we register and Wendy Richardson immediately responds with the link. So can you talk a little bit more, Jenny, about this link, uh, www.shiftthepowersummit.org slash summit registration? What, what should we expect on that platform? Register here. <laughs> Name, <laughs> yeah, that's the registration. Um, we do have some resources, fewer and fewer. I think we've made there are around 120 travel grants that have been made to get people there. So if people are on this call are super interested, we have a little bit of resource, but not a huge amount left to get people there. But that's the, that's the intention is to get the right people in the room to have the kind of conversation that needs to be had. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. And Lana Fajino says, Bogota Shift the Power Summit promises enabling connections that need to be made to really make the significant shift needed for transformation, not just tweaking and tinkering globally. I hope you shall be there at the summit so that together we can put together our collective voices and put down promising actions that can inform our work moving forward. Thank you very much for, for that, uh, um, Jenny, and for all the contributions that have been um, coming in. Isabel Jean says, I can't begin to unpack the colonial flavor of the train analogy above. I also sadly can't name the practitioner as he works 
in insecure context at risk due to the junta. He's one of the most humble people I have ever met. Um, he's seen it all in uh, replying to the INGO responding in responding his country. I think it's a reaction to a previous comment. Thank you very much, Isabella, for sending that. Um, great. Um, I think someone is asking if we shall have this um, webinar shared. Yes, it's being recorded and it will be shared with all of us to make use of it subsequently. At this juncture, we are talking about the road to Bogota and it will be good to hear from you what you think should be on the table in terms of topical discussions. And the Ringo community that is facilitating this conversation is happy to take some of our input, some of our perspectives to the summit. It is very important to note that other key stakeholders organizing this summit, notably the Global Fund for Community Foundation, they are following keenly their ears are on the ground. What do we want to be at the center of conversations in Bogota in December? We will be taking a Mentimeter right away for us to share what we would like to come up as topical issues for consideration at the summit. I'll invite my wonderful colleagues to kindly share the Mentimeter to help us share our views with the Ringo community to take to the summit. And for those who don't know, Ringo is an open space that brings together like-minded key, uh, key stakeholders who want to transform the civil society ecosystem. If you want to be part of that journey, feel free to write to info at ringo.org and we shall engage with you and bring you into one of our spaces for you to make your contributions. We are the Mentimeter has been shared in the chat. Thank you very much, Andrea, for sharing that with us promptly. So colleagues, kindly click on this link and you can share your views with us. And I'm sure in a short while, we will be seeing um, on our screens what the different views are coming up with. Thank you very much, Andrea. In a short while, we will be having the question on the screens. But for those who may want to um, start sharing their thoughts with us, the question is in the chat. What is that one message that you want the Ringo team to take to the summit? Feel free um, to share them your thoughts in the chat. Pour ceux qui parlent en langue française, et vous pouvez partager vos réponses dans n'importe quelle langue dans le chat. Malheureusement, on peut, je peux lire que les propositions en anglais et en français. Donc, uh, so please, what is that one message you want the Ringo community to take to the summit. Thank you all for sharing your insights with us. Some wonderful responses are coming up. Um, the Africa culture and traditions in development, how to organize in order to put more pressure on INGOs, um, political courage, and more of these brilliant views are coming in, reflecting our diversity, reflecting the di different contexts albeit rich that we are working in. 
And I'm sure, you know, we will collect all of this and equally share with, with, with us. So please feel free to continue sharing your input um, via the link. I can see Mauricio Colibri says, um, Trigon Puff, you know, um, I can't read that, um, but I'm sure we'll get the translation of that in English and share with in other languages and share with everyone. Matthew um, Cross says the institutional donors must change and only then will the INGOs change. Thank you very much for that um, uh, remark. Um, we really appreciate that. Maya says we must go beyond the North-South binary. Uh, binary systems of operation and hierarchies. Systems and systems of operation and hierarchies exist at the local and community level too. Thank you very much for highlighting that, Maya. I think it's a clarion call for us to pin that down and make sure that those um, hierarchies at these levels, are, at all levels, are eliminated. Um, amazing contributions coming in there. Justin says, all the remarks by the globe South development partners should mean should mean it when they are making their commitments in shift the power. So we should go beyond talking and uh, practice what we preach. Thank you. CSOs should be made strong enough to hold duty bearers responsible to remove inequality from their society. Thank you very much, Branford K, for that insightful contribution. It is very, very wonderful listening to all of this. And it, listening to all of this, it will be important to come back to our panelists, um, Grace, Larissa, Kate, and Barbara, if you are if, if you are there. We've, we've, we've had all the, you know, laudable contributions, you know, the plans on the way to make the Shift the Power Summit a resounding success and a platform that will help us to crystallize you know, our talking into action. I would want to invite you, Grace. We come from different backgrounds. We have diverse contexts in which we work with. Despite these diversities, how can we collaborate to ensure that our differences do not stand in the way in any efforts to shift the power? Grace? Thanks, Jim. And and I think um, to, to start off, and many people have said this in, in different conversations, is that what we're trying to do is not easy. Um, if it was easy, it would already have been done. Uh, we are building and, and nurturing an emergent system to take over a dominant system. And so at some point, we have to be comfortable with the uncomfortableness. Uh, we have to be able to face some things that we would not, you know, be comfortable facing in, in other contexts because we really are trying to bring about real meaningful change. Within that, despite us coming from different contexts, there, there are key things that bind us together. Um, we, we, we work towards ensuring we can have a better society, that we can have less suffering in the world, that we can be able to um, ensure that there's less injustice, there's more um, equality and equity. A focus on the things that bring us together rather than the things that divide us, I think is key. So how can we work across continents, um, across um, different focus areas that we have, because we are all working towards this better society. Um, we are all working towards ensuring that we're improving lives wherever we are, in whatever context. So I focus more in terms of what brings us together rather than what divides us, but recognizing that this work isn't easy. It's not going to get easy. Um, they say, you know, power abhors a vacuum and we are creating a new system here. And so it's not going to be easy. It's going to be uncomfortable. We need to be okay with that uncomfortableness. So are we working ourselves out of jobs? Yes, because in an ideal society, we shouldn't exist. Things should be working without us, but we're not in an ideal society. But can we see more of the commonality? So practically, um, for us as, as, at KCDF, we shouldn't only be focusing on working with colleagues and partners in Kenya, 
we should be comfortable, you know, reaching out and partnering with colleagues across the world, you know, in, in South America, wherever we should, you know, in Asia, in the Middle East, because we have a common vision and a common goal, which is a better society. So I focus less on what divides us, but more in terms of the commonalities. We are all seeking to fight injustice. We should be speaking to each other in terms of these are the injustices we're seeing. What has worked in your area? What could work in, in the area that I'm in? This is how I'm connecting better with communities. This is how we're transforming our organization to be better. So for the avoidance of doubt, we are on a journey, even as KCDF, we make mistakes and always seeing how can we learn from those mistakes because we're operating in a system that is flawed. But how can we be able to nurture and 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 um, water those systems and practices that we're seeing that are really shifting power? And I must really emphasize the issue of community philanthropy. For us, community philanthropy is one key way that really communities are at the center, communities' resources are acknowledged and recognized and celebrated. And really that is one way we are seeing that lessens it to be less about us and more about communities. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much, Grace. You said it with much ease. Focus on the things that bring us together than what divides us. That makes me to think about some of those checklists with over 100 variables that requires some communities to be able to satisfy at least a high percentage of them before qualifying to collaborate with A, B, or C to work towards a good society. Thank you very much for that clarion uh, message, uh, Grace. It's very much appreciated. Salisu Mahamane says in the chat, il est important de définir une vision et une compréhension partagée avec les populations sur le modèle de développement qui respecte notre environnement, nos traditions, la cohésion sociale et le partenariat avec le reste du monde sur l'atteinte des ODD et de son intégration dans nos projets de développement. Merci beaucoup, Salissou, pour cette contribution. And through that, I would like to bring you a takeaway. You know, we come from diverse contexts. We are, we are working with collaborators who have diverse interests. Despite these diversities, what must we do to ensure that we build a collective force that will drive what Greece describes as a common goal? Tega Wende? Merci beaucoup, Jim. Um, C'est un peu bruyant de mon côté, donc désolé pour toutes ces nuisances sonores que vous allez entendre parce que je suis dans un espace ouvert. Alors, euh, je ne vais pas revenir sur ce que Grace a eu à dire parce qu'elle a, c'est vraiment d'abord le pilier, mettre euh, les communautés au centre de toute initiative. Et je pense que lorsqu'on se focalise sur les communautés, nous avons déjà le point qui nous unit, la communauté. Ensuite, il faut avoir cet esprit ouvert. Pour moi, le mouvement Shift the Power ne peut pas avoir d'impact sans un mouvement Shift the Mindset. Ça va ensemble, en fait. Ce n'est pas possible d'aller... De, de, Donc, il faut déjà ouvrir son esprit à la diversité et voir que... Savoir aussi que les différences sont une richesse et non barrière. Voilà. Et il y a un certain nombre de méthodes, de principes qu'on peut utiliser. Lorsqu'on on travaille dans un milieu euh, aussi... Avec autant de diversité, un milieu euh, multi-acteur, il est important d'avoir un dialogue ouvert et inclusif. C'est le premier point. Il faut organiser régulièrement des réunions de dialogue avec toutes les parties. C'est vraiment la base. Et s'assurer aussi que les, les communautés locales participent activement. Les acteurs internationaux participent aussi à ces cas de rencontre-là et utiliser des outils de facilitation qui vont aussi permettre à chacun de s'exprimer dans sa langue, que chacun puisse faire entendre sa voix. On parle des fois de, de faire monter la voix des 100 voix, mais moi, je pense qu'il euh, y a aussi quelqu'un que, dont je ne me souviens pas qui a dit la même chose, il n'y a pas de 100 voix. Il n'y a que des personnes qui ne sont pas entendues. Donc, faciliter les choses pour qu'on tienne compte aussi de cette question de, la, de justice linguistique. 
On peut aussi intégrer euh, à, à partir de ces dialogues ouverts et inclusifs des cadres de concertation, des cadres de gouvernance partagée, où chacun a la possibilité de contribuer d'une façon ou d'une autre à la planification, à l'implémentation, mais aussi au suivi et évaluation de, de, des actions que nous mettons en œuvre pour et par la communauté. Un dernier point serait peut-être de cartographier. Moi, je pense que Grace est revenue un peu là-dessus dans, 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 dans sa réponse. Elle a dit qu'il faut clairement identifier les acteurs, les centres d'intérêt respectifs, comprendre les motivations, comprendre les priorités. Et c'est ça qui va permettre, en fait, de trouver les points de convergence. On peut aussi, je souhaite ajouter cela si c'est possible, on peut aussi mettre en place ces, ces, des sortes de protocoles, d'accord, de collaboration. Parce que ces, ces chartes de collaboration vont permettre aussi de, de, se, de, de résoudre les conflits en temps opportun. Par les chartes de collaboration, on peut établir les responsabilités de tout un chacun et la, la marche à suivre en cas de conflit pour que la résolution des conflits se fasse de, façon, de la façon la plus constructive possible. Voilà, donc moi c'est vraiment ça, et encourager les échanges. Vous voyez, de la même façon que les acteurs internationaux, les, les, les bailleurs peuvent venir en Afrique et visiter un peu les terrains, les les, les implémentations qui sont faites. De cette même façon, il faut aussi permettre à des acteurs de la communauté de pouvoir participer à des cadres d'échanges internationaux. Il n'est pas, c'est pas forcément tout le temps les OSC qui doivent être représentés. Où sont les acteurs communautaires Où sont, par exemple, euh, voilà, ce cette dolotière qui, euh, la dolotière chez nous, c'est celle qui vend la bière de mille au village. Donc, elle peut très bien donner son point de vue lors d'une d'une rencontre internationale. Donc, il faut vraiment promouvoir cet échange-là et faire émerger leur voix de plus en plus. Je pense que dans ce sens-là, nous allons pouvoir travailler à renforcer euh, cette diversité, cet échange multiculturel, cette diversité qui, je pense, est, est une grande richesse. Merci, Jimmy. Thank you very much. Tigawende for those insights. Kate, of course, uh, it will be good to hear from you, you know, what your thoughts are in terms of, you know, leveraging or bridging the diversities that characterize our work and using that as a force to rely on in our efforts to ensure that there is a veritable shift in power. Kate? Thanks, Jim. And um, it's It feels difficult to, to follow Jenny and Grace and Tego one day because they've said such such beautiful and, and rich things. So I'm going to try and weave some of the threads uh, of those things. And I suppose I'm the first thought that comes to my mind, um, I think, is inspired by the manifesto, um, which I think acknowledges that, that very often the, the system of today, the system in which we operate, actually constrains us by these definitions, by these silos sectors, the power dynamics, the ways of working, which limit rather than expand the possibilities of creating a new future. So Jenny invited us to, to, to think about what's the, what's the new system that we want to, to, to live in um, as people, um, as human beings who are, who are united by that identity um, of, our, of our shared humanity. And I think that's a really good um, invitation. Um, and, and I'm also struck, as Grace said, by how hard it is to not fall back into the trap of seeing the us and the them in the system in which we currently operate. Um, and I, that's making me think about the, the, the journey that, that I feel I'm walking, this transformation that um, I think we all need to go through both personally and professionally, and that the last point on the manifesto of changing changing ourselves so how do we bring this huma humility and this boldness this um the courage and, and the vulnerability that it takes to question how each of us as individuals think about how we hold our own power um and what does that mean for our different identities um so that that feels like one piece of it the the, the humanity and the identities and the, the recognizing the division that's in the system and how we overcome that Um, and then the, the second point that I wanted to share um, when I was 
searching for inspiration on uh, on diversity uh, in relation to this journey to, to Bogota. I um, looked, as I often do, to Maya Angelou for inspiration, um, and she's got a quote which feels appropriate in this session where we're weaving, um, where she says, we all should know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry, and we must understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what their colour. And that says to me that we, we can't go into this thinking that we can change the system, change a system that values some people or some organisations or some issues more than others without us as the people who are shifting the power intentionally valuing the differences um, and the importance of all of the diversity that this group uh, represents. So I think we can see we can see the threads, we can see the different colors. We can decide that we value communities, um, community actors and uh, civil society actors and NGOs and donors, and that everyone has a place in this tapestry that we're weaving. Um, and the important thing about these conversations is that we're able to respect um, and challenge the harmful uh, power dynamics that have made a system that excludes to bring one that, that feels much more inclusive um, and whole, as my colleagues have said much better than I can. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Kate. And some interesting contributions um, are coming in. Fatuso says, Merci pour ce discours d'ouverture sur l'esprit de la diversité et dialogue, inclusive identification des problèmes. Um, et OK pour les mesures claires de la collaboration, surtout le problème linguistique en Afrique, surtout pour l'Afrique francophone. Um, Elisa Fan says, let's build a unified and focused solidarity to shift power to communities. The shift, the power manifesto is a critical pillar of the movement. Um, and we also have you know, Gilbert Edo, who says, shifting the power should focus on reimagining, rethinking and restructuring everything development, starting from the personal through community to national and must, must revolve around mental development through both formal, informal and non-formal education. Thank you very much, Gilbert, for that. And uh, Maya Hassan, salutes the point you raise, Grace, which is a very important one, that let's come together to build something new. And I think the Shift the Power Summit of December 5 to 7 gives us an opportunity to build, indeed, something new. New as we want it, so let's be part of that summit to shape what we want. We, are, we will soon be drawing the curtains for this conversation, but to do that, we were saving the best for last. And we would want to invite one of the key actors in the space, Dylan Matthews, who works for Peace Direct. Dylan, as a person and as a leader of a key organization, focuses on ensuring that we dismantle every contributor to the disequilibrium or the inequilibrium that exists within the ecosystem. Passionately, he's been working to ensure that there is decolonization of aid and any traces of colonial practices in the sector. Thank you very much, Dylan, and thank you for the great work that you've been doing. You followed this conversation quietly. What are some of those key messages that for you, for everyone here, should be central to what we should be taking back home to inform our work moving forward? Dylan? Yeah, we need to unmute Dylan, please. Merci beaucoup, Andrea. Il faut uh, Dylan doit intervenir dans quelques minutes, donc bien vouloir um, activer son micro, s'il vous plaît. Great. Thank you, Jim, um, and thank you for that uh, fantastic introduction. Um, 
I want to share with you a few thoughts, having listened to this fantastic conversation that we've had over the last hour and a half. The first thing I would like to say is, you know, I think it was really helpful that Eshban shared with us the origin story. Some of us are new to Shift the Power, and we weren't there in 2016 for that, that uh, conversation in South Africa or for the conversation in, in London. And I think it was really useful for us to remind ourselves just in such a short space of time, how prominent I think Shift the Power has become. I mean, in a relatively small number of you know years, we've now got, I think, a vibrant movement of activists uh, and uh, people around the world. And that's something to be really proud of. I think for those of us who weren't engaged in Shift the Power early on, I think it's really important for us all to look at the manifesto, to read the manifesto, and to really digest what it's trying to say. There's some really, really important points there. There are nine key uh, statements. As Eshban said, they're sort of invitations for a conversation. And while none of them are more important than others, I was really struck by the first and the ninth. And I just want to, to, to read them out to you now. The first commitment in the manifesto is that we need to embrace a vision of a good society. Build around core value, built around core values of equality, democracy, and sustainability, and a set of organizing principles based on global solidarity and distributed leadership. So that's the first of the nine commitments. The, the last commitment for me personally, I think is the most important. And I want us all to think about how we can do this ourselves because we all have a role in, in the system, in this dysfunctional system that we want to change. So the ninth commitment is about changing ourselves. And you heard that, um, that Kate mentioned that just, just now. We need both humility and boldness and to be ready to challenge our own power and to listen to and work with others. I think it's so easy in, in these conversations to think that the problem is elsewhere. And in fact, we know that there are many stakeholders and there are many pain points and we'll, we'll go through those shortly. But, we have to start with the change that we want to see in the world and we have to change ourselves. And I think that's really, really difficult to do. We are not accustomed to talking about our own power. We feel quite uncomfortable about that. We, some of us feel powerless and actually we aren't. We all have some power to, to make change in the world. So I think that we need to do some deep reflection as, as activists about the power that we have and the, and the change that we can affect in our own communities and with our own uh, constituents. Jim, you asked us to consider the pain points in the system. And when I was looking at the Mentimeter poll, I saw many, many pain points. And I think we all feel that. And I think I talk about this with my own team that it's, it's very hard for us to sit with this tension of both being in a system uh, wanting to change the system and being in a system that is flawed and possibly benefiting from the system, we operate within it. And so we're operating within a dysfunctional system. So what are those uh, pain points? We talked about mindsets and attitudes. We heard from Barbara that there are problems in how we understand risk and issues around fiduciary responsibility. So we really need to dismantle those and really get to the core of what is the problem here. Grace mentioned something striking. She said, something is broken in the system. And in fact, multiple somethings are broken in the system and it is our job to change it. So I would invite you all to think about in your own context, where do you see the problems? Jim invited us to, the, to do that at the beginning, but I think the first thing that we need to do in our own context with our own communities is understand what the problems are because we can't change the system until we, we, we have a better understanding of where it's broken. But I want to emphasize, we can't stay there. We can't stay in just the analysis of the problem. We need to remember that first point in the manifesto. We need to think about the world that we want to build together. So this, this is about holding that tension of being in a dysfunctional system that we're trying to change whilst operating within it. It's also about identifying those problems whilst at the same time having the creativity and the imagination to think about what else might come. And that's quite hard for us to be trying to manage both of those at the same time. And, and Peace Direct's work is trying to do that in, in its own small way, trying to understand where are those blockages, but also what is the, the world that we're hoping to, to, to emerge into. In the panel discussions, I was really struck by a lot of the great conversations that uh, took place and, and really inspired by some of those messages. Um, 
Barbara mentioned the risk of reprisals when we shake things up. Remember that there are those in the system who benefit from it a lot. And actually for them, she mentioned it's an existential threat for them because their role will change. And in our work um, at Peace Direct, we've talked to lots of donors and INGOs and various uh, power holders, and I can see the discomfort. There is a palpable discomfort about the trying to reimagine the world in which they aren't the center of attention. And so we should expect some resistance and some pushback. And we have to think about how we manage that as a group of actors together in solidarity with each other. How can we support each other? And maybe the Bogota summit can help us answer that question. How can we act together to push back and to resist where we see resistance? Um, Barbara also finished off by saying that we need to clean our own house. So back to that whole point about understanding the change that we need to see ourselves and, and what are the problems that we, we are embodying? Are we part of the problem? Can we change ourselves? Um, Tegawende also asked us to be open um, to continuous learning and to challenge the way we understand development. So we're talking about some pretty big conceptual issues here, but those do filter down into some practical things. And I hope that in Bogota, we will have both the opportunity to talk at that large conceptual level around the good society, around the change we want, but also those practical issues. And it was great to hear from Kate around the Pledge for Change, because I think, you know, we have been very um, critical of INGOs. However good they've tried to do in the world, I think we also recognize that their power has been problematic in the sector. And it's really helpful that Kate you know, shared with us openly and honestly about how the commitments that they have made and the work that they're doing. So from there, obviously we heard from Jenny uh, and about the different discussions that are gonna take place in Bogota. And I really would invite us all to consider ourselves part of the Shift the Power movement, whether you're new to it, and this is the first conversation that you've taken part in, or you are one of those long-standing members, please consider yourselves part of the Shift the Power family and the Shift the Power movement. And so think about, if you are going to come, think about what are those conversations, those crucial conversations that we need to have. Jenny reminded us of, I think, three of the most important values that underpin everything that we are talking about here. We're talking about the values of dignity. We're talking about the value of equity and of justice. And we hope that the world in which this good society that we, we are hoping to build and work towards will, will be based on those values. And finally, I just wanted to leave, I think you all with some quotes that uh, were shared during this conversation. The first is in the, in the um, chat, um, and it was the first part of um, a two part uh, contribution by Isabella, Isabella Jean. And she, she talks about what um, uh, was shared with her by a colleague in Myanmar, I want to, I want to read it to you. Externally driven development is like a train driven by outsiders. Local communities are asked to get on and off at different stops by external conductors. Instead, we should be riding the people's train. They might be on this journey for generations, driving their own development. Outsiders can get on and off this train if they want to ride along and help in solidarity. And I think we are talking about a radical reimagining of the system. And I think that for me was a really elegant uh, quote from a colleague of hers in Myanmar about the problems in the system right now. And I also want to uh, repeat a quote um, from Gilbert Adu, who, uh, Jim, you mentioned as well, that Shift the Power really should be about reimagining, rethinking and restructuring. And so again, I implore you all to think, get your creative hats on because none of us quite know how we're going to do this. None of us have the answer. We all have a little bit of the answer. And I think if we put our heads together, we're gonna get there. But that will require us all to be active in this rather than passive um, uh, you know, participants in this. We all need to have that sort of creative energy to create the, 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 the world that we want. And the final thing I want to say is leave really with the, a quote from Grace. And she said, let's see the beauty of community contributions because that's what it's really about. It's about really centering all of this work on the people most affected by the system that we're in, the communities. So let's see the beauty of community contributions and place them at the center. And I'm really hoping and looking forward to seeing a lot of you in uh, Bogota. And I really hope that even if you aren't, and I noticed that roughly half the people in this uh, call aren't going to be able to join us in Bogota. So for even those folks, I want to remind you and reassure you, this 
the Bogota summit is just another step in a long journey and a process. It, the conversations really only stuck, continue there, um, but will continue beyond there as well. So please don't feel that Bog if you can't come to Bogota, that's the that's the only opportunity you know to, to participate in those conversations. Absolutely not. And I think um, you know Jenny, the Global Fund team, and and the Waxy team would absolutely support. You know, our whole aim really is to ensure that those conversations continue well into the future. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Dylan, for that wonderful way of wrapping up this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just one of a series of conversations as we journey towards Bogota. There will be another conversation coming up on the 16th of November. The link will be shared in the chat for those who will be interest, interested in participating, particularly our colleagues from the French-speaking countries across the world. Join these conversations. It is a process, a long journey, like Dylan said, and you and I, as we contribute to these conversations, we will make our own contribution in shaping the future we want for the sector. Thank you very much all for taking part in this wonderful con uh, conversation. Maya Hassan, we can't stop without saying thank you. Sonja Haji, I can see you are in your office following the conversation with your colleagues. Marion Lowe, always very attentive. Ajoy Data, we can't see you, but we see your image smiling at us, you know, for taking part in this. To all participants here present, we really want to appreciate your time for being with us. The Global Fund for Community Foundations, thank you and your wonderful team for making this happen. To everyone in the Ringo community who has contributed and committed to make sure that we keep these open and safe spaces for heartwarming discussions that will help us shape the future we want. Thank you very much to everyone in Ringo. I can see Deborah Grant smiling where she is. And of course, to the Waxi team, thank you all for your ceaseless efforts to make sure that we bring together wonderful people from across the world to continue thinking, brainstorming on what that ideal future must be. Grace Mangi from the Kenya Community Development Foundation, your experiences have always been an inspiration to many of us working on the continent. Thank you for bringing that to the fore and sharing with all these wonderful participants here. Barbara unfortunately couldn't be with us at this time because she's in another conversation at this particular moment. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara North from the Zambia Governance Foundation for all the great work that you're doing and for the voice that you are putting on board this platform. Tegawende Larissa Masur, depuis le Burkina, merci beaucoup d'être avec nous. En tant que Shift the Power Fellow, nous comptons sur vous pour s'assurer que vous mobilisez nos congrès francophones pour s'assurer que ensemble les anglophones, les francophones, ceux qui parlent en portugais ou en espagnol, nous pouvons ensemble construire l'avenir que nous, dé nous désirons pour le secteur du développement. Kate Moga, and everyone at Pledge for Change. You are a model that we are counting on. As you can see in the chat, many were asking the contributions of donors, INGOs, towards the efforts to shift the power. We believe in the collective understanding that all those who are signatories to the pledge are up to. And we count on you in some months to come to share with us resounding success and possible pathways others could or must emulate. The Shift the Power Summit is coming up in a couple of days. Let us prepare, let us ride on, and let us be together in Bogota. Thank you very much, Deborah Abe. I'm sure that is our wonderful colleagues from the tech team. I'm sure they want us to take a picture. You know, although we are online, there are ways to immortalize this. And just to assure everyone here present that we will be sharing the recordings. We will be sharing some of the links to the Shift the Power Manifesto in English and French. We will be sharing a lot of these resources that have come up here with everyone. Yes, Deborah Abe, I can see your hand is up. 
Yes, Jim, thank you so much. Well done, Jim. Well done to all the panelists and all of you for joining and interpreters as well. Uh, we got uh, feedback in the chat session that interpretation was amazing. So thank you all so much. If we could all kindly turn on our cameras so we take a quick picture. If you are at a place where you can turn on your camera, kindly do. Oh, I like that. Thank you all. So there, because there's a number of us, we will take more than one shot so we can capture as many people as possible. Let me turn on my video as well. Okay, hello everyone. So we're going to take the first one. Can we all say shift the power? Shift. We can't hear everyone, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> shift the power. Let me speak for everyone. Shift the power. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jim. So that was the first one. Okay, so let's do the second one, please. Could I say shift the power on behalf of everyone? Shift the <laughs> okay. power. <laughs> okay. Shift the power. That's right. Thank you. So we have just the last one to go. Okay, last one, and we are done. Thank you all so much for joining. Jim, over to you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we have to come to the end of this conversation. It's always sad leaving you, but happy because I live in optimism and with more hope for a future of a civil society ecosystem where the right power will lie in the hands of the right actors. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening, wonderful morning, wonderful afternoon, wherever you are. And looking forward to being with some of us in the conversation that is coming up on the 16th of November. Ça serait presque, ça va porter sur shift de power pour les acteurs dans les communautés francophones. Soyons avec nous le 16 novembre parce que ça serait a formidable, formidable conversation. And of course, to everyone, looking forward to seeing you all in Bogota in December. December 5th to 7th, these are the dates no one should afford to miss. Thank you very much and have a wonderful time. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye. Bye. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Good job. Good job, guys. <laughs> Gracias a todos, muy buen trabajo.